Hello everyone, developers, uh, a lot of friends here. I'm very glad to, to have you here. So this is a developer circle event. You know what is the developer circle? Uh, who know? What is a developer circle? Nobody? Okay, this is a developer circle. This is a, a event where where we share uh, knowledge with people. We, we make uh, a lot of uh, events, a lot of uh, uh, Things I, I I will read because I have my uh, my text here. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, as a hub, uh, the, the developer circles uh, Madrid had the mission to spread the the knowledge uh, uh, in our community, enable access to content, uh, task workshop, and uh, grow the Facebook group where you must uh, to sign up if you do not belong to the community. We, we share there a lot of content, a lot of articles, and the next events that uh, you can uh, 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 come with us. Um, today we have a special event. This is a Oculus Roadshow. Uh, we are glad to have there three uh, engineers from the Oculus Theories uh, who sell with us today uh, priceless tech knowledge uh, to know uh, to use better the, the tools and and thanks to uh, Elena, Mariana, and Ricardo to to come here. Uh, also, I'm pleased to announce uh, the community talk for today by the magician uh, Luca Mephisto, uh, a great Spanish developer. Uh, uh, possibly you you know him. Uh, he's looking for the for innovation and tricks to make uh, the best and complex things. Thank you, Luca, for your time to, prepare, to set up your presentation with no time. <laughs> um, Developer Cycles is a non-profit uh, initiative by Facebook that uh, and they help uh, us uh, with the uh, right resources to create uh, these events like uh, this today. And we are pleased to have with us uh, our Facebook uh, renal leads. Uh, thank you uh, for your support, Vicky, and commitment. With who, who are Vicky? Where are Vicky? Hey, there is Vicky. Thank you so much, Vicky. So uh, before the, the, the panels, uh, we have a, a, a meet and burst as uh, every, every event. Uh, uh, today, we have not pizzas, sorry for this. We have a lot of beers and uh, very delicious food. So I hope you enjoy, uh, meet all the people, the people that you uh, didn't meet before, please. Uh, talk with everyone, share uh, your, your knowledge, the things that you are doing uh, in the rest of the week when you are not in the events. So uh, there is an a, a open space we, we, we set up uh, after the, the, two, um, the two first talks. The open space uh, will start uh, by a company, by a, a great company from uh, developers here in Spain that show us a showcase about a, a new project they are doing. And we will open the mix uh, in Spanish uh, in, this, in this part of the event. This is not recording, OK, the, 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 open, the open space, sorry. Uh, for uh, hear about you, about your projects, to tell us uh, some tricks, tips, or whatever are you doing right now. And whatever do you want to share with the, with the community. So uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Gonzalo, Diniz, and all the uh, Facebook team uh, about, the, about Zona from Facebook. This is Zona from Facebook, a, a very beautiful place where uh, we can uh, 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 organize these uh, fantastic events. So time to enjoy the event. Please ask uh, your question orderly. Uh, we have a mix. Uh, you can. Uh, ask in, uh, in any moment that, that you want. So the next four hours will be awesome to learn a lot of, of things. Uh, you can share your photos using the hashtag Depsy Madrid and Oculus Roadshow and enjoy the, the event. Keep in touch, sing up in the, in the Facebook group of Developer Cycles Madrid. Developer Cycles Madrid, OK? Yeah? And please be an active member of the community. And enjoy the event and enjoy the beers, enjoy the people. and. Have a great time here. Thank you.
O sea, este micro funciona, ¿no? ¿Me oye todo el mundo? No. ¿No? Con el nuestro no. Tienes que usar. Ah, doble micro. Sí. Pero creo que podemos con este. No, 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 con este estoy bien. Con este estoy bien, con este estoy bien. ¿Lo han encendido? Sí. Eh, vale. Vale, pues hola. Eh, mi nombre es Luca Mefisto. Eh, soy un poco nuevo en Madrid, así que todavía quiero ir. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, people from the internet. My name is Luca Mephisto. I'm new in Madrid, so I'm hoping to meet you all eventually. Um, yeah, and today I wanted to talk to you about how I create procedural terrain on that runs on mobile VR. So this is going to be a bit of a technical talk. It's going to run for an hour starting now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, get ready. Um, I hope it's going to be fun for anyone, but I think it's going to be useful. As I said, that's my name. I'm Luca Mephisto. I've been doing XR development for around a decade now. I started in Manchester, and I have been doing, well, I have one there, and I have been doing it for, well, you know, the typical AR and VR training applications, also marketing applications for some of the big companies in energy and also defense. Then decided to start my own company in Manchester and also co-organize the meetup of VR developers there. We have around 1,500 uh, members, and I've been doing now things like inside and outside maps integrated, some sailing simulators, a couple of games that were on Oculus Go launch. Mm -hmm. and I have also done some stuff for museums and for some bigger IPs that some of them are under, under NDA, as you can imagine. But Yeah, that's me, and I, like many of you, I, the thing I like to do the most is just play and just try new ideas and just say, see where they take me. And you can find a lot of those in my website, in mephistofiles.com, and you can also ask anything in my Twitter. I'm kind of active. I am always reading. I just tweet once every week or so, but that's okay. All right, so yeah today we are talking about an interaction idea that i decided to test a few months ago because i always wanted to try the wii balance board to make some sort of game and how it will feel in vr so i took one uh, board connected to a pc and with the oculus rift i did a quick five days prototype uh, sliding down a mountain i'm actually going to press play on this uh, so yeah the game i hope it yeah it doesn't have any volume This is some guy from Reddit recorded record this. Um, basically, you are starting a helicopter. You just jump off the helicopter and you just control. You know, with the weight, you, with your weight, you control where you're going. The thing started to get a bit interesting because I really wanted to learn how to do procedural generation. There is no art here being created. Everything is created with mathematics among all the mountains, etc. And it goes on forever. And eventually, it gets a bit trickier, and you will get to a point if this loads well, where you will start to reach some forest with a, you can even have like 10,000 trees in a forest, and an avalanche will start chasing you, as you can see now. I think he looks to the left. So the idea is you just slide down really fast, try to not hit any tree, and try to not get caught by the avalanche. It was just an idea to really learn how to do. There we go. How do I pull this again? Oh. It all, no, yeah. It, yeah, Google, the enemy, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we're going to stick with this now. Um, so yeah, it was just a quick five days experiment because I just wanted to see how it feels. And that's usually what I do. But this time, I took it to VR Manchester. I have over 20 VR developers playing with it. Some big people from Sony and PlayStation VR try it. And everyone love it. And no one was feeling discomfort. Everyone actually was saying, could you remove the comfort tools and make it go twice as fast? OK, mm -hmm. up to you. And everyone love it. Then decided to put it on Reddit. And it was on the top page for mm -hmm. two days. And then a lot of people love it, like that guy who recorded the video for everyone else. And even people like from Berlin University contacted me like, This is the best simulator we have found for snowboard. And we are actually doing a, th a thesis on how to train free riders doing a snowboard to avoid avalanches. Could you work with us on this thesis? And I was like, oh, yeah, of course I will. And they tested it with 
over 30 pro snowboarders, etc. And it was like, all right, maybe this is a little bit too much for a five-day prototype. So what will I do? I will put everything I'm doing on the back, and now I will have to make an entire game out of this. Uh, but that was not possible because, you know, no one has a Wii balance board at home. Just the 200 people from Reddit who try it, they do have it, but 200 sales is not really good. I also believe that VR is going to be mobile for a long time, and I really, if I want to release something, I want it to be on mobile because you can reach much more people. So yeah, I needed to make a game that can be controlled with a Wii balance board or not, but especially I need to make a game where the terrain is being generated forever in VR in a mobile chipset, and that is what the talk is about. How there is a terrain generating at 72 frames per second on Oculus Go. So presenting my upcoming game that I don't know when it's coming out because really this talk is happening now but it's not near finished. It's going to be called Solar Storm and instead of going down snowy mountains you are maybe going down Neptune or Venus and while being chased by an avalanche but also maybe a thunderstorm because when you make a video game, you always have to turn it up a notch because there's too many people doing the ski games, you know? So this is what I'm doing now in my free time when I get some client time off. So before we start, a few notes. This is a work in progress. I was told I will do this five days ago. This is not even close to be finished and there's no art in it. There's no art. Uh, there is no, I haven't even designed the worlds or, or anything. It's just a few textures I grabbed from the internet. Whatever the noise was generating on the terrain, I just wanted to make sure that I can render four kilometers of terrain and 6,000 trees in a mobile, on a mobile chisep before I hire an artist, obviously. I'm not going to cover the basics of optimizing in VR because I think that's cover, that has been covered in so many, many talks already, what I'm going to talk about is my cheap indie dev solutions to apply these basics so you can, you know, like, I'm going to show you what I do, not maybe uh, applying the lessons that I've learned from these videos about the basics. So just a quick recap on that. Mobile VR is really hard because you have to keep 72 frames per second always. That means if loading this mess is taking me 10 milliseconds, now I have six milliseconds, well, less than six milliseconds to finish the frame. So uh, you can never break this rule or you just, well, everyone will feel bad, but also you won't be able to release it on the store. So it has to be fast constantly. Um, these are lots of things you cannot do. Usually you will have, this is not hard limit, but usually you have 150,000 triangles and 50 draw calls in the scene at any time that for a PC game that's usually really, really low, usually you will have thousands of draw calls and millions of polygons, so that's pretty low. And then you have a problem with basically anything. Anything you can think about doesn't run well on mobile VR if you are just doing that. So you cannot have very good PVR, Unity Terrain is a problem, post-processing is a problem, overdraw is a problem, etc. So how can you render Neptune or Venus or something infinite that keeps people wanting to keep going for an hour, discovering new things, but that doesn't look like shit. Like, so that's, that's the point. So I'm also not going to talk about noise generation a lot, but so, so you know, I'm using Perlin noise to generate the noise. Perlin noise is a special type of noise where basically, in this case, you give it x, y coordinates and it will give you a gradient that feels a bit like a, it feels like a mountain. You know, it goes up and down, it just doesn't go crazy. You have a very interesting talk from Son Murai. He's the developer of No Man's Sky, where they use Perlin noise and other types of noise a lot. So if you want to learn more, you have that. And also Inigo Kile, who I believe now works at Oculus actually, uh, he has a lot of work done in different type of noises. So that looks, and actually this talk is referenced on some Murray's talk as well. It's really, really good. For what we care right now in Unity, you just have to put math.perlin noise and you get a noise. You can change the scale, but that's it. That's what I'm doing. You can use way faster systems, but I will integrate that later because as you will see, I'm not worried about the performance of the noise yet. Um, the clever thing is what you can do with the noise. This, back, this image here on the background is by Inigo, and it's actually created with just one, uh, one signal of noise. 
with different octaves. There's no art going on here. This is just pure math. So this is not where we're going to get on mobile, but this is where we want to try to get. So how do I work with this? Usually, I will create, uh, you have your noise, you have your type of noise. You feed it some parameters to, you can multiply it, you can divide it, you can clamp it. Say you want to make a mountain, but you clamp it at a height so you have some kind of plateau. You create your different type of noises, like separated objects, and you start to merge them together. Maybe this one is multiplying this one, and now the mountains are being cut by rivers. Uh, maybe this one is adding some kind of small lumps. Maybe this one is adding some kind of dunes. You add all together, and you get a noise texture. And this is going to be, in my game, a tile of 350 by 350 meters divided in separation of 10 meters. So that's 1,200 vertices, uh, what you will have here of information with the height of each one. When you work with Unity, I really recommend that you use scriptable objects because it will allow you to say, this is my object for dunes, add it to the world, and suddenly you have your dunes. This is my scriptable object for mountains, you just drag and drop, and you have your mountains uh, happening in the world. But how do you turn this into a mess? And this is where things get a bit more problematic, because when you do this tutorial on the internet, they will get choose a mess for every single vertex, they will go to the noise, check the values, and say, oh, White is 1,000 meters up. Black is zero meters up. They just go to each, every, each single vertex and move it up, depending on how white this is. You should not do that on mobile. What you need to do is decouple the data of the noise from the generation of the mess, because generating the data, calling per noise, is expensive as hell. It's super expensive. I mean, not super expensive, but just calculating the 12,000 1,200 points here takes 15 milliseconds. That's your whole frame gone for one tile, and you have maybe to render 50 tiles. If you are doing it at the same time as you are creating your mess, you are screwing up. So what you need to do, and now is where we start to get technical here, is this is the tile, OK? Forget about these two for a moment. This is my tile. I have this prototype of a tile somewhere else. When I need to load the tiles around me, First, I create the data, and I put it into a data structure that will have the height information, where here is 1 and here is 0. But I also calculate all the things like the normal and maybe some kind of type. Like, if I come here, I could say, this will paint it blue because it's a river. This will paint it green. And this will paint, I don't know, red because it represents mountains. You keep that all, inf all that information in a data structure. So when you need to check your values of noise, you don't need to use the noise, noise function ever again, because it's prohibitive. You do that. Now you come here, and then you take your prototype of your mess, <coughs> go to your data structure that you can access in constant time, because everything is sorted in rows and columns, and say, you are this height, have this normal, you are red, and these are your UVs. Next, 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 next. And then you generate your piece of terrain. You have to take it one step farther, because sometimes, in this case, we're going to need to have several, several different levels of detail. So in this case, I created this other level of detail and this one. And actually, this one has some connectors that connect this one to that one and this one to that one. And how do you populate these messes with the data structures? You don't check this ever again. You just lerp between the values. It's one of these points, maybe falls in between these ones, but you just come here and lurk between the points you already have, and that's obvious, but pretty much no one is doing it in all the information I found on the internet. That makes it loading the tiles really, really fast. The next thing is, when you are creating the order you are calculating the things, is also really important. Most people will go for every point, calculate the height, the, norm, the normal, the type, and the UVs. But for calculating the normals, you need to know the height of all your neighbors. Don't do that. Just calculate the height of everything, and then you do another pass. Well, you just go to the neighbors that you access in constant time, and you calculate the normal of that point. And then you do another pass, and with the normal information and the height information and the color information, you modify it a bit so it looks a bit more interesting. Then you take everything, and because you are not really painting anything 
in the screen yet, you're not doing any math, you put everything in a background thread. A background thread that just needs to populate maybe 10 tiles when you move one entire tile. So when we move one tile, in, which is 350 meters, we're going to need a new row of tiles two kilometers in front of us. Then you take all those tiles, chuck it in a background thread, wait for them to finish. It's not going to take a single time of your Oculus Go frame time. <coughs> and then when that's done, you start populating all the messes with the information that you have to calculate in the right way, because if not, just calculating normals too early will take you five times to calculate a single tile. Um, yeah, so another thing, when you are populating the messes, you also want to spread this load. You don't want to load all the messes all the time, and you, for every single tile, and when I say tile now, I mean the representation of a tile, you don't, want to, you don't need to load the three level of details. You just need, if it's the farthest away, you just need to populate the low resolution one. And you just do that one. And for the close one, you just do the high resolution one. And you don't do all of them in the same frame. You do one every frame. You cannot put this in a background thread because Unity, but you have to do one every frame to have everything running. Another good thing of separating the data from the representation is that the tiles now can be pulled and because they are going to be an object, you can take them and when they, if your snowboarder is here and you're moving in this direction, obviously when this tile is not used anymore, you just remove it, change the data structure inside and chuck it inside and chuck it in front again. This way, maximum you have, I don't know, 40 tiles of terrain that are <coughs> recycling themselves with a background thread all the time. This is a small caveat, which is draw calls. Every single tile has their own has its own mass, very different than, to the, than the rest, and they are not static because they are moving forward. So you cannot use instant, instant systems on Unity because it's different masses require different draw calls. You cannot use a static batching because static batching needs the tile to be static and they are moving forward constantly. So you have to use, you can use dynamic batching if you want it to batch. Again, this is a work in progress, no one gets scared, it will look so much better at the end. But so you, this is high resolution tiles, they are, they are 1200, yeah, 1200 vertices in these ones. These are low resolution ones, they are a little bit less than 300 vertices on this one. And the low res resolution ones have like, yeah, 150. Uh, this represents like one kilometer of terrain, okay? So you are going to be tiny inside of this. The size is not a random size because Unity uses dynamic batching for messes that are under 300 vertices. So if this is at 301 vertices, it's not going to batch. Um, but doing it, it's going to batch automatically and you don't have to do anything. So that's indie dev solutions, you know? I don't have to do anything, it's quick. But you just have to be careful with the resolution of your terrain. And maybe this one, I could split it in another nine smaller but high resolution ones so they will batch. The solution is, in the end, usually you will be here watching f on the front seat, I guess. But you are from 150 draw calls, you are down to 50. And when you are in first person view, you will be down to 20. And if I do the trick to also split this one, I will be down to 15, 15 for the terrain, which is the main thing in my game. And I have like 35 draw calls for everything else, which is pretty good. Okay, so far so good. Uh, the next thing is how do I paint the terrain and make it look like a terrain? The obvious solution always is, well, the mountains will, when I say this is a mountain, I will paint red on the vertex. Vertex information always. If not, it's going to be blue. If it's a forest, it's going to be green. You could do that, and then you have your textures and say if it's red, put the rock texture, is like a splat map. And it's going to look like, yeah, not really interesting. So we really want to make something that looks a bit more alive. So in your background thread that is calculating the data, so this is not taking time from you because you calculate using the normals, for example, you maybe take the reds, and if the normal is flat, you make it blue. And you do this in the background thread into your data structure because many people will do that in the seder, and that's just a dot product that you have to do every frame. 
But if you put it in the background thread, you just calculated one. You put it on the, on the vertex information, and now suddenly you start to have a bit more interesting stuff where the snow can come on top of the things and it start to look a bit more interesting. And for no price at all, this is the Seder is the same. It's the most basic and lead Seder ever. Everything has to be in the data. Now you want the textures to blend, you know, and this is a typical terrain thing where, where grass and rocks start to meet. You want to start blend them. And it looks really nice, but usually requires, it always requires that for every single fragment, you have to read, in this case, two textures, sometimes with a high texture, sometimes if your terrain has seven textures, you have to read seven textures in every fragment. And that is prohibitive. Usually reading three textures is all right. Suddenly you read four or five, and out of nowhere, your speed just goes down to the floor. So what I wanted for my system is I want to have seven textures of terrain, but I just want to read one texture in every fragment. The first solution is how do I pick the texture? Uh, because it's usually good to keep things in, a, instead of having to chuck the nine textures, it's usually good to use something not many people in, Uni uh, in, Oculus, in Unity uses, which is called texture arrays. It's a texture that submits entirely into memory. And then you can give it an index, say, I want the texture, read this texture array, give me the one, or give me the two, or give me the third texture. It, it costs one texture read to do. And it does style very well, because if you, put your, if you put your maps in an atlas, like it's usually recommended in all these talks about how to optimize, but if you are doing a splat mapping and you need these textures to tile, and it's an atlas that is subdivided in a square, and you start tiling on this grass, suddenly you come back here and you usually have a horrible seam. If you use this, it's, it, you get it instantly uh, working. Uh, Unity is not very good supporting it, but I did write a small wizard to create your own, but really, it's as simple as that. Oh yeah, and it, your texture array will look like that. It's, again, three textures I just source on the internet. So now we can read just one single texture depending on the color, and the result is Eh, it's not great. It's ob there's no blending going on here, obviously. You have the rocks and you have the snow, and there's no blending going in between. And it looks a bit dull. So can we make some blending without reading more than one texture? Yes, we can, because there is a solution that actually Oculus have, have a really nice write up, which is about dithering, which is, you know, on Monkey Island and all these games where they just have two, type of, two types of blue, and they make any type of blue by mixing, putting a light one and a dark one, a light one and a dark one, and they create some gradients. You can do the same here. And what I did is I read this, it was really interesting. I took a noise function. This is a typical Seder noise function that if you do Seders, you have read it thousands of times. I don't know where these numbers come from, but they come from a really important man or something because I think they even have a name. Usually here you will have a sign or here. You can swap that with a frac because it's so much faster in the GPU, and for these things, you really don't care. It's going to look pretty much the same. You swap that, and now you get some noise, and you apply it to do the blending, and when you are not sure about what texture to pick, you run this and say, okay, give me sometimes more of one or more of the other. And, so, and now you can control this granularity, and you start getting, this is a really close up thing, you start getting this dithering that it's a snowboarding game, you know, you are going down fast. No one is going to stop, look at this. But this is quite obvious, this is not so obvious. Now people will think this is blending. You can even get a bit creative because this is going on the space. And if you want, you can just increase the levels to something ridiculous and start having shapes like this on the blending. And again, it's just the price of this and one texture read in your whole say there is nothing going on there. Next. It's okay, now we can blend, we can read the textures. How can we choose what text terrain, UV, what UV on the texture to choose, what coordinate of the texture, you know, so they feel like they go on forever and they scroll forever, etc. This is a very common solution to terrains, which is called triplanar mapping. Basically, because we don't have an artist saying how the texture unwrap on the terrain, you need to automate it. Triplanar mapping is the useful, the go-to solution where basically you take the same texture, in this case it's like rock texture, you project it in X, set, and Y, 
and you blend it together. There's a problem. I just went through a lot of effort, so I won't have to blend anything and read three textures in every fragment. So this is not good if you want to have very fast terrain running on mobile. Could you bake the information of the tree planar mapping into the data? Kind of yes, and these guys there did this solution to map. This is automatically mapped it, uh, map it with that function. You can do it. I use it with this. This is information baked directly into the, into the data, so the seder has to do nothing. But where it joins different angles, you see this smug thing. It, 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 there is no distortion in the texture here and there. It looks the same. So your, your walls are not going to look super stretched or anything. But all these connections, they look horrible. It does work great if you have something like uh, tar surface uh, items like you know, a car, a tank, whatever. But on terrain, it doesn't work. So the lazy solution, and this is not the final solution, is you use projects from the top, the texture, and just grab it on the terrain. When you look at it from the top, there's no distortion in the texture anywhere. When you look at it from the side, obviously everything that is on the flat plane looks amazing. Everything that is vertical looks terrible. This is cheap as hell because it's just pretty much the X set world, pos world position and that's it. But it looks horrible and it will have a lot of stretching here. Not a good solution again. What could you do? <coughs> so. This is another, I thought, OK, maybe the problem is, you know, when I'm going from this point in x to this one, which is flat, I'm moving one meter, and this one one meter, and this one one meter. But suddenly I have a mountain, which is here, and I should be doing 20 meters of texture here. And I'm just doing one meter, because in x set is one meter. What about if I just store the distance to the neighbors in the UVs to do the unwrapping? Looks good on paper. You don't have any distortion here. You don't have any. You have a bit of distortion, but it's a terrain. So if it's a bit moving, it's okay. You don't have distortion there. It looks amazing. Now, what happens if I have this massive straight line where the texture is moving? I don't know, 100 meters from vertex A to vertex N, and on the side I have a mountain where the texture needs to move 500 meters, and then they meet. Well. This is down the terrain, one kilometer, everything makes zero, zero sense. And everything starts to distort a lot. So this is a solution to that, which is if the problem of this one is that the noise is getting, here works, but it's getting out of control really quick. Can I control that noise? Because I want that. This looks good. It looks decent. I mean, the problem, these problems are not big problems on a terrain that has supposed to look not always the same. But that's massive. Can I control the error? And yes, you, yes, you can. If for every single tile of terrain, you say the texture here starts at zero, and here ends at one, period. Here starts at zero, here ends at one, and this texture here starts at zero and ends at one. That's so far so good. It's just like putting the texture. But the UVs of the the UVs on the vertex, in, instead of being the distance to the neighbors are going to be the proportional distance to the neighbor. So you just zoom the distance of all these vertices, which is going to be, I don't know, 300, and say, OK, between you and you, what it is? 1, 1 divided by 300. That's your UV. And for the next one, and for the next one, you give the proportional distance. So you make sure that in the end, they all end in the same spot. But the errors will start to spread themselves around the tiles. And really, yeah, you will have some little things sometimes but it just looks good. It looks looks good, and you have to do nothing in your seder again, but just applying this kind kind of technique. Your terrain has to have some properties on how the noise is distributed, depending on the size of the tile. But it does work really well, and it's as easy as possible. Although it took me like three weeks to figure out. Okay, now we have that. Next thing is lightning. If I'm in a space, I mean, if I'm Mercury, I want to have the sun, I want to have shadows. I need light to give some shadows, to give some variety to the terrain. The problem is, can I bake shadows on textures on a four kilometer terrain that keeps creating four and four kilometers all the time? I can't. Can I create, uh, can I create dynamic lights with four kilometers, because I have really tall mountains, four kilometers distance for the shadows, and I still run everything else? I really can't. 
So my solution is I'm going to bake this information also into the vertex data as the alpha and just multiply by that, by that number and see what comes, comes out. So yeah, this happy character is the sun. Um, this is one slice of my terrain in x, OK? This is all of these points have x0, and this is set. And we are going in this direction. This is a trick. My game, in my game, you always go down. You cannot go uphill. So you are going always down set, faster, slower, left to right, but you're always down. So you're never creating tiles behind you. You're always moving tiles behind you to the front of you. So if I put the sun here, I'm all, all the new mountains I create are, case, are going to cast shadows into the new tiles, but never the other way around. So if I create a crazy da data structure that for every slice stores the position of the highest peak, now I'm generating in this direction, all right? So now for this point here, I will say, are you in shadows or are you, in, uh, are you bright or are you dark? I say, OK, the vector from here to here cross product with this one is pointing this way. You are dark, 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 dark. And now here, I will say, this vector is over this beam. So you become the new peak. And now I can tell if something is in, in the shadows or not. You can do that. And the result is horrible. It doesn't look great. And this is the whole point why we use textures, you know? So they give us more resolution than just vertices. So you can really tell here where there is a vertex. And it doesn't look high resolution. I mean, it, it doesn't look nice, but this is something going on here. And I really wanted to go th down this route, and I figured out I don't want to read a texture for this, and I cannot even afford to generate it, but I really want these shadows. So what about if we store, instead of if you are in darkness, I will store how much in darkness are you? What is the distance? Not if you are in dark, darkness, but what is the distance from this point to this beam? Here is minus 10. Here is minus 2. Here is plus 2. If I do that, and if you, you imagine this is a terrain quad, and this is coming down here, and this is the light value, now, before, I could see that obviously there's a vertex here in dark, dark, there's a vertex here that will be bright. But now, if I use this other way of calculating it and saturate the value in the fragment shader, now you can start doing things like this, and you don't know. This is just vertex information, but you don't know anymore where the vertex is. Yes, it has some small artifacts. But now, what it was that, you can start doing things like this that looks way more sharp, and you cannot tell. The resolution of the terrain is this horrible thing, and now it looks so much better. And then you improve it a bit with some value so it doesn't look obviously pitch black. And you will start something like this. For just in the shader, you are just multiplying by the alpha of the color on the vertex. That's it, and saturating. That's, so this is a very powerful, powerful technique if you are rendering terrains. And it's cheap to do in the shader. There's nothing in the shader going on. But these are nice extra as well. Because when I was here, I was saying, hey, if this point is, in, is bright, move the, I mean, when we are in the bright side, I was saying, if this point is in the bright side, move the highest peak here. But what about I wait a bit? And I say, no, actually, store that this is a plus two bright. Now you can start getting some highlights on the brightness where the, this is unlit, there's no, uh, there's no light. It used to be news here. You can start seeing some uh, highlights on the brightness coming into these slopes, uh, slopes that are being cast directly into the light. So we had this, then we play a bit with the normals uh, in everything in our background thread, nothing in the shader, and we got this. And now we can get to this with, again, zero processing power being used on runtime. Oh, we're, going, we're doing good. Everything is going good. Everything okay, right? It's not too bad. Uh, I could do a bit some extra stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go deep into this, but a friend of mine, Mark, hi Mark, I hope you see this. Um, he's in the camera. I know some people watch behind, but um, he is using some kind of mostly eye adaptation, as he, as he said. Well, you can make the whole scene look darker or clearer as your eyes adapt. I could just do this because, you know, when the player is here, it's just a constant call to my data structure to know if the player is in a dark area. And I could make 
the contrast higher, and then if I come to a, a bright area, I could make the, uh, the contrast uh, smaller, smoother, and you could get that for free as well, uh, just with this way. Next thing is fog. Fog is really important when you are generating terrain that is constantly being generated because it will hide all your trees be being created, it will hide all your tiles being destroyed, it will give a feeling that it really never ends instead of just seeing the end of the world. Unity fog <coughs> looks incredibly dull and many people will try to use volumetric fog that looks amazing but again we are on mobile and up what you see now is just like 20% of what will be in the end game because when I have an artist I will have to add more draw calls. This is just the base and the less things I add now, the most post-processing I save, the better. So you could use that, Unity Fog, but because we have the information of what was really, really bright into our vertex shader, we can create, I know it has some artifacts, but you can just move it on the fog coordinates and without having to, without having to do any kind of volumetric fog, now you start getting all these highlights and it's some kind of fake volumetric, fake bloom kind of effect, which is just doing this with the alpha of the color of the vertex because you calculated that that was supposed to be very, very right. So that's really cheap and it already looks better than this. But you could again take it one step farther and you could, I'm going to store the height of the mountains before the slope, okay? So you have the slope and this mountain here is at 3,000. This mountain here maybe is at minus 1,000. If I store some height data before applying that slope, I will know how big is a mountain, like in this space, let's say. And if you do that, you can multiply by another new fog that I can create, and I will give it the shape of, uh, this is watching the terrain from far above. The player will be here, hidden in this direction. The sun is here, uh, it will be behind you. And I'm going to cast a fog that just looks like a triangle. This is just two multiplications and a zoom. And what you can do now is you can multiply that, that by the peaks and where you have this code, where you will put a post-processing now, again, you just need to multiply by a value and do a lerp, and suddenly you start to have this post-processing fake effect that cut, cost nothing to render, and it will make your game look more alive. So this is the type of tricks uh, I'm actually talking about, and I have a few more tricks of this one. Um, well, but I'm not going to talk about this one because I'm working on some dust storm, etc. I need clouds. This uh, storm coming on, you know, this a storm coming. I want to have some weather systems. It's really important for the player to make it not feel like it's always the same sky. It's repetitive. But again, volumetric clouds, they are really expensive to do on mobile. There are some solutions like True Cloud that run on mobile, VR mobile, if you are just doing clouds they work. If you put two things more, you cannot have clo clouds anymore. You have another solution, which is using particle systems, but well, you cannot cover the whole sky, and they cause a lot of overdraw. And then I came across this fake volumetric idea, which I'm not fully using, where you take one noise texture and check it twice in different positions and scroll these two textures on top of another, on top of each other. The, you then stack 100 planes of this one, you multiply it by a value so the top planes are a bit you know, narrower, and then you can get some, it's not, they call it fake volumetrics, but really it's more like lazy volumetrics because it's volumetrics, but just, you did everything in 100 planes instead of one, so a lot of overdraw. But what I really like from this guy from Puck, he uses this clever system to know if an area of the cloud should be highlighted more and he just check the texture twice, put it on top of the other, and move it a tiny bit in the direction of the sun. And this is flat, but it looks like it has some thickness to it. I mean, it's not the fluffiest cloud ever, but this looks thick, a bit thick. So this is how I do it. He is doing it, calculating it in every fragment. He has to check what is the distance, what is the direction of the sun, convert the thing to tangent space, add it, move it, do the thing. But you know what? I know where the sun is. The sun is always behind me. So I don't need to do any calculation like that. Like that. I just need to take the typical cloud texture that you will get out from Photoshop 
and copy twice, but on the G channel, I just move it a tiny little bit to down, like five pixels down. Okay. This is the typical. This this is not being used yet. Well, just for creating the noise. Uh, this is the typical two scrolling noise textures moving, and it will look entirely flat. I mean, not entirely flat, but the only thing giving you volume is that this look darker. But this is going to be just two triangles, massive triangles in the sky. But now, if you use G here, which is the same texture read, you don't have to read textures anymore. It's just one texture, read, well, two texture reads for the whole shader. You already know if the sun is here, you can paint this a bit white, and this and the bottom not so much. So it looks more like these places are brighter. Now you know where is the direction of the cloud and you can give it some volume. And well, and because it's just a quad, it's really easy to do effects like covering the entire sky, etc. And the effect, yeah, it's not the best for the effect, the best clouds you can you can do, but they have some thickness. They have some thickness to it. And they look really well, really good on mobile. It costs nothing. It's just again one texture read and almost no overdraw really because it's overdraw against the sky where there is nothing. Um, I wonder if I could add more thickness. This is the G channel coming into play. But if I add more displacement, maybe on the blue and alpha channels, maybe you can even do it four times as thick as thick as that. I don't have the time, but I will try to do that. Two more to go. Yeah. The next is going to be a quick one is obstacles. The way I render obstacles, I, I use them kind of similar way with a scriptable objects. So I will have one tree. I won't do trees in the final game because they are problematic, but I will have one rock, one tree uh, in a scriptable object with the noise dispersion of them. So I will use the same function for that. I will use level of details, like the good old, good, good old level of detail. And then do you want to use dynamic batching or do you want to use instancing, which is so much more powerful? Because all the rocks are the same rock, but sometimes you know rotated and moved, so it looks like another rock. You could use just uh, instancing in Unity. The problem is many people will say that you cannot use instancing and dynamic batching that we were using for the terrain LODs, but you, really you can. It's so freaking difficult to find information about shaders, but it's just a tag that you just put disable batching true or false, and now you can enable dynamic batching and your GPU instancing and start render all your trees start to render all your trees. A few, a couple of caveats on how to do it. If you are suddenly coming down and see a forest of 6,000 trees that you never sown, have sown to the GPU ever before, you are going to halt for a good two, three seconds. So I'm just cheesy about it. Again, game developer, indie developer ideas. At the very beginning, I saw you every single tree that you will see ever again in the game. It's obviously, there's going to be a helicopter here. You are not really going to see it, but I'm going to render it to the camera. Like, hey, this, watch all these trees. So when I show you the tree again, don't load it into memory because you still already have it. I'm sure there's a nicer way of doing this, but this is good enough. Then you create a pool that's the same, same old, same old. Well, on the initialization, maybe you want to already start changing scales and rotations. So later, you just need to move them, not also give a random rotation and a random scale. Uh, all you can save in the initialization, that's good. And then you just create your good old pool, but making sure that you don't put, if I create this new tile, I don't want to put all the trees at once. Maybe 10 per frame, 20 per frame, you can use a stopwatch to kind of know how much time left you have in your frame. So maybe you know, hey, maybe I can put 100 trees, or maybe I can just put 10 in this frame, so I won't stop. That's for trees. And the final thing is physics, which is really quick, so don't worry. <laughs> so physics are a massive problem, of course. Um, this was really the problem I was having when I run it on the Oculus Rift. For the Oculus Rift, 2,000 draw calls was not a problem. Hundreds of texture reads were not a problem. Millions of polygons were not a problem. But 6,000 trees with their rigid body, with their collider, or without a rigid body but a collider that I need to keep moving, it, will kill. it was killing my CPU constantly. It not, it's not just the obstacles, it's also the terrain, it's also how I simulate the board. So I'm going to explain how I solve each one of them. The first one is so obvious, it took me ages to figure out. Not all trees need a collider, you just need to put a collider in the tree you are going to hit. <coughs> so if every single obstacle I store it in another data structure that is like a dictionary of positions, 
I can access that in constant time. And when I am in this tile, I can say, hey, what are my nine nearest obstacles? This, these nine. And I have a separate game object, separate nine game objects that are the three colliders separated from the mess and say, okay, put the colliders in each one of them. And that's all going on. This is the same nine colliders moving themselves forward. And you really are going to hit, you can hit every single tree and fill it with all smoke and mirrors. You can even go a bit crazier because you could add sound, you could add uh, to every tree, etc. But in the end, it's just nine instances of a collider. The terrain was kind of the same idea, but to, taken to the next level. So you have a piece of terrain. And the typical idea you will find around is I'm going to put, put a mesh collider on that. This is not a convex mesh collider. This is not a convex mesh. So calculating where you are interjecting this mesh is really complex for the CPU to do. And it's not going to work great in the, in the edges. So I had this pro at the beginning I was doing this, just doing this, and I was falling through the edges every 10 minutes or so. If it, something will fail and you will fall through. So you can use some crazy system. Uh, I could implement my own physics system. I did try. It was like it will take me the whole time of I have for developing this game. So never start doing your own physics system. You have other systems like bullet physics that are quite powerful for this as well. I did investigate that. But in the end, I figure out like the cheapest, faster solution for me is like I don't need the whole mesh collider for every, everything. By the way, just inflating the mesh collider for a tile, it's 10 milliseconds. So you don't have time for that either. I just need a few triangles. They are convex. They're really cheap. You, it's constant time to guess where you are uh, intersecting with them. So I just need to put a few triangles here on the next square, on this square, and this square. There are eight, 16 triangles is everything I have for terrain collisions. May, maybe some of you are wondering why there are two square triangles in this terrain triangle, but that's because this looks like it's going to be a square triangle, and is it, it is not. It took me also one week to figure out why my triangle was not fitting if I change the scale to that. Uh, but thankfully, with two square triangles, you can make any triangle in the world. So you have just 16 triangles that are moving every 10. If this is 10 meters, you just need to move half of the triangles when you move 10 meters. You don't need, same as this, you don't need to move them all the time. You just need to move them when you move far, far away enough, which is around 5 to 10 meters. And you don't need to move all of them. So here, if I move from here to here, and I have this, four, 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 four. I can leave this four and this four. I just need to move these eight triangles to this place here. So you're just moving eight triangles every 10 meters. And it it's cannot get cheaper than that. And the last solution, and by the way, I never fall through the edges or anything. It just works. And the last solution is I was trying to get very crazy with the board simulation system. And in the end, I discovered that pretty much all games that have this, it's just a ball going down. It's just a ball rolling down the slope where you apply forces to the left, forces to the right. And if you go back to the uh, perpendicular to the slope, you just increase the drag. That's it. It just works. Um, I use some scriptable objects again. You will have one problem, though, which is the resolution of the terrain, again, is 10 meters kind of squares. And with really sharp edges, although the, in the normals, it doesn't look like that. So you're going to start getting very bouncy rides, where it's bouncing like it's on stairs. You just can make another bigger sphere that is not interacting. It's just like a force field that moves the board up. So it feels more like a smooth ride. And that's it, really. It's just, oh, I'm going back. And that's it. Now you have a smooth ride, not, the, not this bounciness for the price of two sphere colliders intersecting with one triangle and eventually hitting a capsule, and you're making the whole, and everyone will believe they can interact with anything. And you can really, I, I never managed to break this. And this is some special bonus round, but because I've been talking for 50 minutes, I'm going to skip it and say thank you very much for listening. I hope it was not too boring. <laughs>